thank you for being with us today. No, thank you for your invitation. Well, great. Uh, you have a very uh, complicated kind of last name, so can I refer to you as uh, your staff, I believe, as Mr. Z or Jay-Z? Jay-Z, <laughs> Jay and, and, and I have received a lot of complaints. The rapper is really in shock that more people refer to him as the other Jay-Z. Okay. So definitely, so in Kansas City, I'm the Jay-Z. You're the Jay-Z. Totally. Okay. Okay, well, uh, let's start with your background. You mm -hmm. have such an impressive uh, internationally international background. Can so you give us a little bit about Well, yourself? actually, Sugasagoitia, my last name is, is from, from the Basque region of, of Spain, but uh, through the Second World War, both my mother's family and my father's family immigrated to Mexico. And I was born in Mexico City, grew up there, um, and then eventually went to France to do my studies. And uh, one thing led to another. I started working with UNESCO, then I started working with the Getty, taking care of a lot of cultural heritage uh, projects throughout uh, Africa, throughout uh, Europe and Middle East. And then um, in 1999, I was invited by the Guggenheim to join the staff of the museum in New York. And from there, I moved on to El Museo del Barrio, which was the first time I became museum director, also on Museum Mile on Fifth Avenue in New York, so just blocks from the Guggenheim. And from there, to Kansas City. So it's, okay. it's in a nutshell, that has been a little bit of a, of a long way to go. Mexico City, Kansas City was shorter, but I had to go all the way through right. Europe and the world to come back here. Right. <coughs> now, within that time, you learned six languages? Totally, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. wow, impressive. Yeah. So, okay, um, the job opening comes up in Kansas City, and you're yeah. thinking what? So what I'm thinking is, first of all, the Nelson Atkins is a museum that is so well known. Many of the works of art that we hold in our collection is, is the, those art, works of art that I learned when I was studying at the School of the Louvre, you know. And of course, the Louvre has pretty good paintings itself, but there in the school, many of the works of art that we were referencing, whether it's Chinese art or, or European art or some others of the collections were works of art. So the Nelson Atkins name has been in my m mind for many, many years in the art world. So when the position was open, the other factor that was very important is in recent times, one of the things that had brought it back to the forefront was the extension, the new wing that is the block building that has been created and designed by uh, Stephen Hall. And I know by chance happened to know Stephen for many years and also the opening for him was a very important thing. But when it was voted by Time Magazine uh, that year in 2007, one of the 10 wonders of the world and one of the 10 most beautiful buildings of the decade. Well, definitely it, it, it brought even more to my attention. So definitely the Nelson has been always in the back of my mind, but uh, when the opportunity, when um, Mark Wilson announced that he was retiring and the search committee reached out, it was, it was really a sense of the opportunity of leading a world-class institution. After all of the great efforts to put it where it is today, you know, it's to put it really on the map because what it takes to renovate, to expand, to put all the collections at the level they are today was an amazing effort of the predecessor and all the generations before. But uh, the sense that there's so much yet to be accomplished is what it got me here. Well, I understand <coughs> it was a unanimous, a unanimous decision to uh, hire you as the new director. I hope the, it's uh, not down the hill from there. <laughs> <laughs> so the the set starts after. Oh, well, <laughs> um, <coughs> you spoke of plans during your first year yes. hmm? to explore the most remarkable treasures that yes. we already have, and I believe there's 33,500 arts. There's art exactly, are there are almost 33,000. Now, like most museums, uh, we do not have them all on display on public view. Some because perhaps they're not ranked high enough to be shown at all times. Others, because they're so precious that we rotate them on a constant basis so that their lifespan is expanded. So for instance, there's some scrolls, paintings, Chinese scrolls, or some works of art on paper that are so fragile that the idea is that we show them, for instance, every three years, you know. And, and those are not natural rotations, and we do, or we do special shows around them from time to time to invite the audience to rediscover them. But the greatest part of our masterpieces are always on display. And, and we have from our Caravaggio to our great Chinese sculptures to our uh, African collection, 
or photography that, for instance, that, that is one of those collections that changes and rotates constantly. And it is such a vast collection and it's such a vast uh, wealth of, uh, of works of art that I wanted to create a device or, or, or a series in which it would force me almost to be in contact and, uh, and, and look at all the collection in a very systematic way. So that is when this lecture series called Art Tasting with Julien uh, appeared because what I recognize is that the curators have an enormous amount of talent. They know their collection so well. I was coming here with less knowledge of, of that, uh, of their materials. And so what I wanted is to engage in a dialogue more out of the sense of my being not an expert in every field, but an art enthusiast, just like you. You okay, know, like right. we like the arts, but we don't always know everything about a piece of art. So what we want is, and what I'm asking the curators is to tell me why it is great, why this painting is better than this one, right. or why do they see <coughs> this one being more valuable, or why didn't we buy it if, if for one reason or another a piece of art was not you know, a collection that we did, passed on. So those conversations have been fascinating and the public has enjoyed them. There's some more casual, it's like, you know, it's like having a conversation right now, it's more casual, it's, it's, it's those kind of moments in which the curators have enjoyed also that even if we have a large audience and we're very fortunate that our auditorium has been filled uh, for each of these, but they feel like we could be in a kitchen having a drink talking about art, and that is a bit the spirit, and that's why art tasting. And, and, and these are held <coughs> every Thursday? Or? It's one Thursday, I think, a month, okay. and so each with each uh, curator I've had one of these conversations. I could not do it once a week because the, the rhythm and the depth, also the, the study that I need just to prepare and to, to would be to sustain, and no one would want to see me once a week either, I guess. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to take a break, and we're going to be back with uh, one of your other acquisitions that was uh, kind of interesting. Perfect. We'll be right back. Travel advisories to small business loans, government car auctions to finding a new job. To get information, go to the official source, USA.gov. Hi, and welcome back to Conversations. We're here with Mr. Jay-Z of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. So. Thank you for being back with us. Um, now, one of the uh, other acquisitions that you uh, have under your belt is the uh, purchase of golf carts. Yes. And you renamed them. So give us a little bit of backstory on that. So, yes, I, I think it, it is uh, perhaps uh, one of those things I had not anticipated. Uh, and definitely as a museum director, I had never thought golf carts would be on the shopping list okay. for us, more thinking always about antiquities or contemporary art. But what happened is that, uh, and in a way, with the, with the new expansion and with the redeployment of all the collections and the, the beautification of our campus, one of the things that has also come is the fact that it is 70% bigger than it used to be, the museum. So that comes it's a great pride to have more space to deploy our collections, to show more art, to have it more engaging, but some people also feel that it is now quite a walk, and especially the new block building that descends a little bit. Sometimes you, we don't have all the visitors go all the way to our beautiful sculpture park. We have, a, we have some uh, Noguchi pieces that are just to die for, very, very, very uh, zen space almost, you know, with a little fountain. But we're seeing that we're not capturing that, and a lot of people then approach me and saying sometimes that it is difficult to go all out or come back after seeing a show. So in order to to circumvent those objections or those, those people who cannot, we thought of how can we bring people in and out, shuttle them. And that's how the shuttle carts okay. existed. And so this is, again, one of our generous patrons uh, brought to the front. He's inability to walk uh, comfortably after seeing a show, back up. And he suggested that uh, if we were come with a good idea, he might uh, fund it. So Crosby Kemper is underwriting this experiment. We will experiment it for a year uh, to see how it affects positively uh, the visitorship. And if it does, then we'll carry on throughout. And we have invited also, so this is golf carts. So the first time I think any museum will ever have a golf cart, really ferrying people up and down and also in the old building so that people feel as comfortable as possible 
um, during their visit. Having said that, one, one of the things is that definitely a golf cart is not very attractive. So we invited a great artist, uh, Peregrine Honig, uh, to think and dream how to transform it. And we're right now working with her in transforming what looks like a golf cart into a magical thing that will take you like in, in your best dreams from one point to another. So it's an artist working with us very closely into making this an art piece that will have a functional purpose. Okay. <clears throat> so that's gonna be fun. So these are the shuttlecocks, right? That is the shuttlecocks. Okay. And you know the title is a spun and, and, and also a fun on perhaps the signature piece of our collection when, when you visit the Nelson or even when I was researching for this position and bought some city guides, many of them had the shuttlecocks mm -hmm. in the front of the museum as the signature piece for the city. So shuttlecocks, shuttle carts, and, and it is funny that we are associated so much with, with that piece uh, by Kleist Oldenburg, who's a genius, and, and who used then the old building as if it was a net. So the metaphor is that it's like giants playing badminton across the building. So you have some shuttlecocks on one side of the lawn, some on the other. So that is, that is part of that. Very interesting. And as you know, we're always interested in sports too. Right, right. And I was going to tie that in with your um, <coughs> your current e exhibit there. Yes. Um, and that is the, um, you wanted to create a, or nurture the relationship with sports, of course, yeah. through the uh, acquisition of the James Naismith's original uh, rules of basketball. And in your words, you named it as the birth certificate in that sport. Exactly. Well, what, what I realized upon coming here and, and stop being part of this community is the real passion that there is behind our teams. And whether it's the Chiefs, whether it's the Royals, but especially basketball. So that, that's when I understand. So we have three great teams in this city or in this metropolitan area. And... Uh, witnessing that and having gone with uh, uh, David and Suzanne Booth who acquired those uh, those rules of basketball to see uh, a game at the Field Allen House it was amazing and I saw the energy and everything and they just had acquired that and all of a sudden it came to our minds as like why don't we show it to the public in the setting of a universal encyclopedic museum and it may be not the natural thing, you know, because there's sports museums and also in the field house there's a, a museum devoted to the art of basketball. But it so happens that on the one side this is the a document of creativity, a document of the ingenuity and the talent of someone inventing and as I said, as yeah, the birth certificate of something that now is global, you know. And Naismith was amazing in so far that he lived through seeing the creation of his game in 19, 1891 to see it in the 1936 Olympics being played as an Olympic game. So yeah, that tells you how quickly it went. But in any case, having those documents there, those two pages very humble at the same time, but it, it just tells you the spirit that there is. And our attendants have loved it. I mean, people are visiting. So people who are not naturally museum goers have discovered the museum through that. And our museum goers have discovered also the art and talent that there can be on a sport and, and everything behind it. But a, a funny anecdote also is that we were researching the, sh the, the signature piece that we just mentioned, the Klaus Oldenburg shuttlecocks, in one of his drawings, and we have them right now on display so people can see the connection. He first thought of a basketball and a basket. And so the basket is the orange, and so in the shuttlecock is the orange. And so you see one idea metamorphosing into what it really became. So from, from basketballs to birdies, it was already there. Wow. <coughs> Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, I, I, you've, I've rode past there a million times and I've seen that yeah. display and I'm thinking, what was the meaning behind that? So. Oh, and it was very controversial at the beginning, those shuttlecocks mm -hmm. outside, and now they're part of the city. And, and you know, it's the same thing with, with the block building. When you say controversial, what do you mean? Well, there, they, were, there were people that didn't, didn't think that it was appropriate. And, and you know, it's an artist, Klaus Oldenburg, that is so playful. He's a pop artist. So in the same generation as, as, as uh, many others that were using things from everyday life and transforming it into art. And so some people still, you know, why did Warhol do a Campbell soup? That is not art. Well, today we've grown to love all that. And I think our shuttlecocks is the same thing when they were first installed. 
uh, the, there was a lot of community uproar, and uh, the same people now love it. You know, okay. I had someone call in the other day uh, and, and commenting on, on on some of that. It's it is very typical of our community. You know that they hate something and then love it. The same f would be true uh, for the block building. As we were building it, there was a lot of a lot of resistance, um, and now that it is up, everybody loves it. And of course, it's it's glows in, in the night. And it's gotten rave reviews. I've seen that. Totally. Uh, tell us about the Ford Learning Center. That is also part exactly of, of our expansion. The Ford Learning Center is our classrooms in which we bring children from all the school districts uh, around us to first see in the flesh, I mean a real object, you know, and there's nothing, there's nothing like seeing an incredible masterpiece. And today with all the technologies, whether it's television or the net, internet or the computer, we, we have access to a lot of things. but that is just an appetizer when you really see a big uh, painting by Manet like we're be going to be showing now a tribute by Manet you're just in awe of thinking that a man and that is a hundred years ago was painting and transforming what he saw with his eyes and you have pictures of that into a poem almost or five thousand years ago people believing in different kind of gods and, 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 and sculpting the stones like in Egypt to, to represent what their beliefs were. So what a museum does is take you to all those kind of experiences and, and I think what's great is that our children have that opportunity and so they go visit the museum and then they go to the Ford Learning Center with our great docents and our great uh, art uh, teachers and they do something. So they, for instance, my daughter was recently in one visit about China around the Chinese New Year. And so then they went back to their classrooms and did some dragons and uh, some rabbits because I think we're in the year of the rabbit. So, but they were doing with clay. Imagine the pride when she comes back home and she explains what she was doing and everything. And of course, so those are the transformative moments. And the kids, you know, that don't have that many opportunities sometimes to engage with art. Uh, they see and, and see it in a different light because art, there's never a wrong or right answer, you know, it's, it's just what you feel. And so sometimes it, then these kids are bringing their parents back after they come and visit. So the Ford Lander Center is accomplishing a very important role of our mission. I think that's what I love the most about art is that there's no right or wrong answer. Oh, there's never. No, <laughs> and you know, that is, that is something that I'd love to share with, 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 with all of you that are watching us today is that the reality is the museums are you know, sometimes people don't know how to go to a museum. I mean, it's it's just like, should we already know the things we're gonna look? And actually, it's not. It's about just enjoying a casual stroll in an indoor environment that is safe, in which anything you think is right, you know? And there's emotions, there are sometimes things remind you of things. Sometimes things disgust you also, you know, like, why did they do this, you know? So, but all of that is telling you what is your comfort level, things that are, provoking your thought. And sometimes if you're with friends or with your family and everything, the conversations that appear through the excuse of art because you're confronted with something that is not your normal are very interesting. So, okay. and, and you know the time in which people would say, oh, the museum has to be silent or no one talk, is dead. That is, that is bygone. It's, it's a place where to talk, to have conversations. One of the greatest things we've introduced is that... Let me take a break real quick. Yes. We're, we'll be right back with that thought. And I I'll promise. I'll tell promise. you about the new technology okay. to discover the Nelson, okay. of course. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back. I always pay more than the minimum balance on my credit card. I just opened an education IRA for my kids. I never invest more money than I can. How are you saving for your future? Find out more great ways to save for your future and choose to save. Thank you for being back with us and we're here with Jay-Z of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. Thank you for being back with us. Now we left off talking about uh, engaging uh, individuals into coming into the museum Definitely. and there is another uh, way to do that through technology. Technology is, is part of our life so and the Nelson has been also jump starting. Actually I have here on my phone for instance like everybody can have in their intelligent phones and if you don't have one of these we can lend you one when you visit the Nelson with a guide. It's called NA Guide. So Nelson Atkins so naguide.org or you can also visit on, on our website and then links. But what you have here is all the collection. So you can press one to three and then you get the explanation of a work of art. You hear a voice of the curator telling it to you. 
or you can plan your visit if you're not there. So it is really one more way of being very accessible. Okay. So you can discover it with that. But as I was saying earlier, this is just one more layer because it is, going to a museum has to be on your terms. And where it's just to have lunch at Roselle or, or just spend, have the kids go to the Saturday art classes while you just enjoy one of the galleries. You know, there's so many ways of seeing and enjoying a museum. Okay, wow. Um, you have uh, an extraordinary uh, gift coming your way. Totally. Pretty soon this spring mm -hmm. uh, from Roxy Payne. Exactly. Is that a national, internationally known Artist. sculpture? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Tell us about what he's bringing. So, so the, the great thing is we have, uh, we have one of the very important uh, parts of our collection is the Sculpture Park the Kansas City Sculpture Park. And that has been nurtured and created by the whole family foundation under the guidance of Martin Friedman, who's a great curator and former director of the Walker Art Institute. And in that relationship over 20 years, they've built the great pieces. We have the Henry Moores, we have uh, many, many, many greats of art. And so when Martin Friedman announced that he was retiring from that relationship because uh, of his age, he, he the, the Halls wanted to make something as a gift for him. So they, want, they you know, they, they asked him, what would you like as a gift? And he said, oh, the, what I really would like is to do another commission. So he commissioned Roxy Payne to do one of his dendroids. That is a huge tree, almost 60 foot tall. So imagine that is, that is going to be like three story high in our sculpture park. And it's all metal. And, and it's, he, they're welding it right now. We're going to feature some, some videos in our website also. And and you'll see him also install it. So you can go into our website and see the camera, webcam, how this comes to life. But they've been working for more than two years in getting us ready for this uh, moment that we will be celebrating in, at the end of April, beginning of May. Now, are they installing it or are they actually constructing it on site? So they were working on it because it's really metal rods that are then put together and really to create a huge form of, of, of a tree, and they've been doing that in his studio, upstate New York. Then they take it apart in X numbers of pieces, put it on flatbeds, and so from New York all the way here over three or four days, three or four trucks will be crisscrossing the country to bring them, and then we have to build it up again. Okay. So it's a whole process, and I tell you, it has been over two years of work at least to, to get it right. So you guys must be very excited to oh, get the, that in. The big moment is coming, and exactly, I hope everyone who's watching today will join us during the ceremonies launching this. In well, honor I'll definitely of be there. Because, of course. <laughs> oh, yes. I can't wait to see that. Um, tell us what's involved the process of obtaining art. And you know, a museum is always in that relationship of, of, of enriching your collections because uh, a museum ha is a living entity, and so you're very involved in trying to get new art, new artists, expanding your reach. So recently we opened the Native American galleries, you know, American Indian art is very important. And so that is, again, by, by, by adding wings to the museum, you keep engaging with more relevant. The way you do that is, is various ways. Most of what we're trying to do is engage generous donors in a relationship with the museum. And that has different levels. People want to contribute sometimes to education activities. Some donors want to contribute just to making it bigger or larger. Some want to contribute through giving us works of art, you know, and some through working in our relationship in which we, we choose works of art that they will give us. So there's many ways. And sometimes you're not necessarily in the buying or acquiring works of art. Sometimes you're in, in borrowing and exchanging. So uh, very soon we're going to be opening also a beautiful exhibition on Monet. We're featuring one large panel uh, that is a triptych of the water lilies. And of course, the water lilies is one of the favorite subjects of, of Monet's work. So we own in our collection one of the panels. And the two others are in public collections, one in St. Louis Museum, which is also a great institution, and the other one in Cleveland Museum. <coughs> so as colleagues, we collaborate. We put them together. So we're going to feature it first. And not only will you discover that beautiful panel in a setting that is really a beautiful environment, but also a lot of scientific research that we did collegially to, to uncover many of the secrets of a painting like this one. And then it will travel to St. Louis and to Cleveland. So that is those collaborations in which we borrow each other's works of art to make uh, contributions to scholarship and to the enjoyment of our audiences is a, another way to expand our reach. Um, they say every picture tells a story. Totally. 
Uh, is, is there any particular piece of art that uh, you can uh, relate to? You know, it's, it's funny that uh, I guess I relate to so many, for so many different reasons, you know, and, and if it's, it's each, what I like about the Encyclopedic Museum is that there's so many cultures. It's like a time machine. You go, if I go into the Egyptian galleries and see our mummy, it tells me about a time in which the pharaohs were ruling, but again, our mummy was a servant to this pharaoh, so just imagine those times. Or then you go to our our English, uh, we have like a little, like, like a, like a recreation of a room and it, you feel you're almost transported to another time. Or then you see, our, we have a great, great China from uh, China collection. So you're transported to great civilizations. And then if you pinpoint one piece, it's always the last one or the next one. You know, and right, right now I have in my office the privilege of having a recent donation by uh, a wonderful support of the museum, Rupa Bansal, who is originally from India, but has been living here for many, of many, many years. And in honor of her deceased husband, she was looking a way of celebrating the memory of her husband. And they found a piece that is the, ce the celebration of marital love. And so you have a divinity and her wife in, in a beautiful representation. And that right now, they just gave it to us in honor of her husband. And you know, that, that, that is the meaning of everything we love is she chose a piece, thanks to our curator uh, of Indian art, Kim Masler, they chose a piece that signifies something personal for her, but at the same time, that is a wonderful masterpiece that any museum would have wanted. So for me, it's not only the masterpiece that I see today. When I see that piece, I see, I see her. I remember why she wanted to give it to us, uh, what it means to her. That, and at the same time, it's a piece that tells you about Shiva, and, and you know. So there's so many layers, um, and so each work of art is more than a thousand words. It is personal stories, and each of those works how they come to the Nelson is a story in by itself, which is amazing also okay. to think about it. That Most way. of the exhibits and the tours, of course, are free. Yes. Now there are, with a few exceptions of those that uh, they charge just a small price. Exactly. It, it, the, you can see and visit the whole museum uh, free of charge. And uh, the only exception is temporal exhibitions that cost a lot of money to put together. We, we charge for that. but. That is seven or eight dollars, and uh, and if, again, if you're a student, there's discounts. So there's no obstacle really to visiting the Nelson, other than the the amount of time you have. And you know, if you have very little time, it's you can do an in and out quickly and see one thing very focused. If you have a whole day, you can even have lunch. And so it's it's depending on your time, how you want to visit and how you experience it. Okay. But by large, we're free indeed. Okay. Well, thank you so much for My being pleasure. with us today. It was a pleasure hearing everything about the Nelson. Uh, uh, museum, and if they want in more information about it, they can visit your website at totally, totally. Our website is www.nelson_atkins.org, and you know it's a great way to prepare your visit. Or after you visit, not only you see the times when we're open and what we offer, but also after you visit, you can research more things. So it's a website that is growing, very interactive. We're going to be featuring more and more things. So definitely okay. something to ex worth exploring. Well, thank you so much for being My with pleasure. us today. And, well, thank you. and we'll see you next time on Conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.